As Meshibbeth said to David, he said, why should you pay regard to me, a dead dog? And that was after David had said, you shall eat at the ta my table all the days of your life. And I, I say the same, why did the Lord pay regard to me, a dead dog, a flea, a worm? I don't, you know, I, I, I start to say I don't know why he did pay regard to me, but I do because Isaiah 43, 7 says that he saved me, he formed me, he made me for his glory and that God would be glorified. And that's why I'm here to testify today because I believe the Lord will be glorified through me testifying to the to great salvation that has been all of the grace of God. And that, you know, I just pray the Lord helps me to make much of Christ as I mention things from my past and uh, where I'm at now. And so, you know, I grew up in the church um, at around five, six years old. I said the sinner's prayer on my grandmother's step in front, in, inside of her house. I remember where it was at. And I remember years going on after that, my hope of salvation was in that prayer, uh, me accepting Jesus. That was, I would always go back to that. I remember the spot, I'd think about it, and I would grab some assurance from there and hope in that. Uh, my hope wasn't in Christ. My solid rock was not Him. I was trusting in a frame that appeared to be sturdy, but it was going to let me down in the end. And so around 12 years old, I started going to the grocery store with my mom before then, but around that time, I started to take notice of the magazines in the checkout aisles. And at 12 years old, I got heavily addicted to pornography. And, you know, for next nine years of my life, I was a slave of it, whether it would be from internet or magazines or wherever it would be, I was living for lust. It was what drove me. It was what satisfied me. And the incredible thing is, no matter how much you get, it will always leave you empty. And one of the greatest, I guess, deceitful things about any sin is the pursuit of the sin. And as you're pursuing the sin, there's exhilaration, there's excitement. But once you gain the sin and you satisfy yourself with the sin, then it just leaves you barren and empty. As I heard once said, sin will take you farther than you ever want to go, uh, keep you longer than you ever want to stay, and cost you more than you ever want to pay. And so around uh, 18 years old, um, well, you know, in middle school, my parents took me out and homeschooled me. Uh, I lied. I didn't do any high school, basically. I played video games 15 hours a day for five, six years of my life. That was all I did. I played games. Um, I had more joy being a video game character and worrying about the, the level ups and the gear that a character had than my real life character. Uh, when I was 18, my parents forced me to get my driver's license. I didn't even want to drive. I wanted to sit at home in that computer playing games all day long. That was my, my god, my idol, and it went hand in hand with internet pornography. Just that computer, you know, I was there literally in my heart bowing down and worshiping that as my God. And you know what? I look back now and I see, man, I was, I was a fool. Uh, I was going to gain that and lose my soul for all of an eternity. Well, around 18 years old, I really hated the sin of pornography. I mean, the shame, the guilt that it caused in my life, it just made me miserable. Uh, I would be on my face crying out to God, saying, God, I'll never do this again. But I kept going right back to it. I was consumed. I was controlled by it. The impulses that came upon me to pursue sin, well, they, they absolutely controlled me. And I really was striving to get free. I remember doing courses. I remember getting internet filters. And at 18 years old, uh, I had a burden to put a testimony up because I was free of pornography maybe 30-something days. And I, I put an a audio testimony up in a video on YouTube. Uh, this is at 18. This is three years before God saved me. Uh, three years before I started albionist.com and I remember I put that up and you know I started falling back into the sin and I deleted it. I took it down and I kept trying to pursue freedom from pornography and here here's something I want to emphasize is and it's so huge my God was freedom my God was not Christ I was pursuing freedom instead of pursuing Christ. The, the reason I was going to go to hell was obviously my sin, but the big idol was freedom. I wanted to be free of pornography, uh, of masturbation so badly. I wanted to get it out of my life. Uh, you know, I remember a relationship I was in. I thought, well, man, if I ever marry this person, how am I going to live uh, with myself being married and still looking at pornography? I thought, I, I don't want to be in a situation like that. So I had all of this worldly grief 
is uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, I had all this worldly grief that was motivating my pursuit of freedom. It was not Christ. I had not seen that cross as precious at all. I was totally deceived. Another place I gained false assurance from was in Romans chapter 7, where Paul says he did the things that he did not want to do. And I remember uh, other people in my life, even youth pastors and people, just they would, give, they, would get, they would give me assurance I was saved because of what Paul said in Romans 7. And I can look back now and realize Paul was talking about when he was a Pharisee. You know, of course Paul wanted to be free of these sins because his perfection was in pursuit of the law. It was a work salvation. And in the end he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? And it's Christ. And as you go into Romans 8.13, you see that by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the flesh. If we don't, we will die. I remember growing up, I'd read Matthew 5.30 about how if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, chop off your arm, or you'll go to hell. And you know what's crazy? <laughs> me and all my friends would read that passage and we would think that can't mean what it means because if it does, we're going to hell. But we're Christians. We said the prayer. We believe in Jesus. We go to church. So we would take that text and say, it cannot mean what it, you know, you take 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, don't be deceived. The sexual and moral will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I remember I thought, well, that can't mean what it means because then that means I'm going to hell. That means I'm not inheriting the kingdom of God. And the issue was I would look at all of my friends and most of them appeared just like me. And so I thought, well, they're all Christians, I'm a Christian. And I was not looking at this standard, this book, this Bible. And so my plea to you guys out there today is look at this book, look at this Bible. Does your life add up to this? Have you truly been born again and saved? Have you been regenerated? You know, regeneration in Ezekiel 36, it, it, it says the desolate lands that were once barren as wastelands will now be like the Garden of Eden. And God comes in there and He says that I'm going to take out the heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh, I'm going to give you a new spirit, and I'm going to cause you to walk and obey my statues. And lo and behold, that wasn't a reality in my life. And at 21, I believed myself to be saved. I was lost. And I would be going to a Bible study. I remember going to the Bible study one night, and uh, you know, I started to have an interest in the Word of God, and I started to talk to all the guys in the church about we got to get free of pornography and masturbation. You know, what's this going to take? You know, we had all the safe eyes, we had the internet filters, we did the 60-day courses. None of it was working. Well, we weren't saved. That's why it wasn't working. I went home, and I remember I walked in the living room, and my family sadly was watching. There's some TV show, Deal or No Deal, and there's supermodels on it. And I, I looked for one second, and I saw. A model and all these thoughts of lust flooded my mind and I went back to my room and sitting in my room I just felt the lust I, I overcome me the thoughts I couldn't I couldn't take them captive I I, I look back now and I realize I didn't have the Spirit of God um, in me False teachers are God's judgment on people who don't want God, but in the name of religion, plan on getting everything their carnal heart desires. That's why a Joel Olstein is raised up. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because they want exactly what he wants and it's not God. And you can line them all up along with him. That's where it is. For ourselves, teachers in accordance to their own desires. So you get a Benny Hinn in there who all he wants to do is tell you you're going to have a Mercedes Benz. Those people aren't victims. They're, he is God's judgment upon them. They want what he wants. And so they accumulate him to themselves along with all those other teachers because they teach exactly what they want. Do you see that? You boast in the fact that God has children running around all over this country full of carnality, steeped in sin, doing whatever they want, and God does nothing according to your preaching. But they're saved, bless God. When you preach their funeral, you'll preach them straight into heaven. I've seen it a thousand times. Remember just a while back, a man in my own town in Illinois who was a known drug addict, drug dealer, fornicator, absolutely everything. And he is there. He passes away. 
And the pastor of one of the largest Baptist churches in the area, standing there at the funeral, that that place is loaded with every person that's hardly ever been in church, drug addicts and everything you can imagine, are all there in church to honor their dead friend. And that pastor gets up and he says, I praise God, I know this young man, he sowed a lot of wild oats, but when he was nine years old, I was there when he prayed to receive Jesus Christ as his Savior, and he's in heaven today. And all those lost sinners went straight out into the streets justified in their sin because of conservative evangelical Baptist preaching that's typical in almost every church in this country it's true it's true and it's pathetic it's pathetic you say oh that's mean-spirited let me ask you a question my mother passed away last year but I remember three years ago when I went to the doctor's office with her because she thought something's not right. And that doctor, very gentle, very noble, he looked at my mother and he says, Miss Washer, he goes, you've got cancer. And he goes, uh, it, it's, it's radical, it's bad, and we've got to move right now if we're going to have any chance of saving your life. I want you to know that man made my mother cry. He hurt my mom. She, he ruined her day. We were going to go out to get something to eat. He ruined her week. He tore my mother to pieces. But he tried to save my mother's life. And if he hadn't done that, if he hadn't been so truthful, she'd have had no hope of salvation whatsoever. We'd have had no recourse at all. And he could have been kicked out of his own practice for being immoral. They ought to kick most pastors out of their practice. Because out of cowardice or self-preservation, they will not preach the gospel. That's all there is to it. This job's not for cowards. It may be for wild men and fools, but it's not for cowards. I'm telling you there's too much at stake. Too much at stake to allow this to happen any longer. And it'd be different if it was happening in churches that denied the deity of Christ or substitutionary atonement. But this stuff goes on every day in, men, in men's churches who hold to these truths. But when they get to the gospel, they just seem to lose their minds. This country is not gospel hard, and this, gospel's, this country is gospel ignorant because most of the preachers are gospel ignorant. It's just the truth. That salvation is not merely the change of practice. It doesn't even begin there. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's not New Year's resolutions. It's not this strong conviction to want to be a different person. None of that. Salvation is a supernatural work of God whereby someone really does become a new creature. Really. That's not poetry. It's not poetry. It's not poetry.